Hello, and welcome to this ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. I'm John West, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, a part of the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also a past general chair of the SC Conference Series and vice chair of the ACM Special Interest Group on High Performance Computing. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen now. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, along with support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items uh, that are also on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, Press the F5 key in Windows or Command-R if you're on a Mac uh, to refresh your browser. Um, if you're on a mobile device, just refresh your browser there. Uh, you can also close and relaunch the presentation. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation and click the Submit button. I'll organize those questions as Jack speaks, and he'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address as many as he can. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available online. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. We hope you'll take a minute to fill that out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the menu dock at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag pound ACM learning. I will be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is Current Trends in High Performance Computing and Challenges for the Future by Jack Tangera. Jack holds appointments at the University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the University of Manchester. He specializes in numerical algorithms in linear algebra, parallel computing, use of advanced computer architectures, programming methodology, and tools for parallel computers. He was awarded the IEEE Sid Fernbach Award in 2004. In 2008, he was the recipient of the first IEEE Medal of Excellence in Scalable Computing. In 2010, he was the first recipient of the SIAM Special Interest Group on Supercomputing's Award for Career Achievement. In 2011, he was a recipient of the IEEE Charles Babbage Award, and in 2013, he received the, I, the ACM IEEE Ken Kennedy Award. He is a fellow of the AAAS, ACM, IEEE, and SIAM, a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Science, and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. So, Jack, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much, John, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about a few things related to high-performance computing and look at some of the directions uh, that we're headed in the future. I guess first we should um, take a look at uh, how science is done. For me traditionally, science and engineering has followed the, uh, the, the mold of doing theory and doing experiments by building physical systems. And in some sense, uh, certain experiments and certain theory we have these limitations. Uh, perhaps it's too difficult or too, uh, too cumbersome to build very large wind tunnels to test out some of our designs. It may be too expensive to carry out an experiment uh, where we would be better off doing it through uh, some kind of simulation. Or sometimes it's too slow to carry out certain, certain kinds of events that we'd like to study, like the collision of galaxies. That's an experiment 
that's very hard to uh, orchestrate, but we can manage to do that in the context of simulation. So we use computational science to help us in simulating things which are really too hard or too difficult uh, to carry out through theory and experimentation. So computational science uh, through high performance computing provides uh, a better understanding of what's going on around us. And uh, it really provides a wide range of applications uh, that can be investigated through this uh, mechanism. Here's just a few, a few things from air, airplane wing design through uh, geophysical flows, through diffusion of solid bodies and liquids, to weather forecasting, to deep learning, and uh, massively parallel uh, data mining. They all can be tackled and um, understood in a better way by using high performance computing. If we take a look at the state of high performance computing or supercomputing today, uh, we see the following uh, situation unfold. We have supercomputers which um, execute in the range of um, uh, petaflops, so that's 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second. So when I talk about floating point operations, I'm really referring to adds and multiplies uh, of 64 bit operands. So we have machines that operate, um, uh, we have 117 computing systems today which operate at greater than uh, one petaflop uh, performance level. Uh, there are really three technologies that we see evolving for high performance computing. Well, the first one is taking commodity processors and putting them together in a box with a high performance interconnect and we call that uh, a, a supercomputer. We put many of them together. A second, uh, a second way of getting to that point is to put commodity processors and augmenting them with some kind of accelerator that boosts the level of floating point uh, performance that we can achieve. And we think of that accelerator as being something like a general purpose uh, graphical processing unit or GPU. And today we have something on the order of 88 systems which, uh, which use that mechanism uh, to accommodate uh, supercomputing. And the third category is using very lightweight uh, processor cores, processor cores that have very simple kinds of structures uh, associated with them, not the complexities of our commodity processors, and enable us to do uh, high performance uh, scientific computing. And we see that uh, emerging with um, uh, uh, through, through the ARM processor, the processor that's used in our, in our cell phones, and also with uh, other commodity processors from, uh, from Intel with its uh, Knight's Landing uh, processor and uh, IBM uh, through its uh, Blue, Gene, uh, Blue Gene line of uh, machines. Um, there's interest in supercomputing uh, worldwide and it's uh, growing in many markets. Uh, one of the interesting things, if we take a look at the list of the 500 fastest computers today, what we see is that about half of those computers are used in industry. So industry gets it. These machines provide some kind of strategic advantage for their products and their company, and it provides a, a way to uh, effectively understand what's going on in a better way than they could with, uh, with the use of, of other kinds of mechanisms. Today we're looking at uh, uh, extending the range of computing and going to exascale computing. So that's 10 to the 18, or a billion, billion floating point operations per second. And we see projects existing in many countries and regions that are exploring ways to get to that exascale uh, level of performance. If we take a look at those 500 computers, the 500 fastest computers, and we look at what kind of processors they're using today, we see this sort of incredible situation where Intel processors are used in 92% of those 500 computers. And AMD follows with about 1%. So the instruction set that's used in 93% of the 500 fastest computers is the x86 uh, instruction set, which I think is just, just incredible. Um, if we move on and, and take a look at that list of the 500 fastest computers, um, uh, we're going to do that through the eyes of some data that we've been collecting, and that data has been collected for the past uh, 24 years. Um, this is a, a list of information that goes by the name of the top 500 supercomputers. Uh, we rank the supercomputers based on a benchmark, and the benchmark that we're using in this case is a very simple benchmark. 
Uh, we can argue if this is a reasonable thing, and uh, I'd like to argue that uh, later in the presentation. Um, but the benchmark is, is called the LINPAC benchmark. It solves a, a, a dense matrix problem, AX equals B, a very simple problem. And uh, the idea here is to solve that problem using a very standard algorithm, Gauss elimination with partial pivoting, and measure the rate of execution for solving that problem for a very large problem. Basically, fill up a computer with a matrix, the largest matrix you can fit in your, in your computer, solve it using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, doing, a, doing the best implementation you can do for that particular algorithm in 64-bit floating point, uh, uh, arithmetic, and then uh, we will uh, look to ensure, of course, that you've achieved uh, the correct results, and uh, we look at the performance or the rate of execution that you were able to maintain for solving that problem. This list of the 500 fastest computers um, gets updated twice a year. It gets updated in November at the uh, big SC conference. Uh, that conference uh, will be held in uh, Denver uh, this year. And it's also updated at, a, at another a supercomputing event, which is held in Germany in, in June, and that'll, that'll, be, uh, that'll be held in Frankfurt this year. All of the data for the last uh, 24 years or so has been collected at that website, uh, top500.org. This, in some sense, is a snapshot, if you will, of uh, supercomputing for the past 24 years. What we're looking at here is um, uh, the, 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 the orange line is representing the sum of the 500 computers. So that's an artificial calculation just using an Excel sheet to compute the, the sum of the 500 computers that was achieved. And today we see that number is at 672 petaflops for the sum. The red line represents the computer at position number one. So that is the fastest computer. And today, the fastest computer achieves a, a rate of execution of 93 petaflops. So 93 times 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second was achieved to solve that benchmark program. And the guy at the bottom of the list is represented by that blue, uh, that blue curve. And today, uh, the position number 500 uh, is, is with uh, 349 uh, teraflops worth of, of computing power, 349 times 10 to the 12 floating point operations per second. So you can sort of see where things have been um, uh, going back for the 24 years. There's a number of interesting things that, uh, that sort of shake out from this list. Uh, you know, we might look at the slope of the curve. If we look at the slope of the curve, we might think it behaves something like Moore's Law doubling every perhaps 18 months. In this case, this line is doubling not every 18 months, but every 14 months. So it sort of gets a boost in some sense, and that boost is coming about primarily because of the use of parallel computing. If we take a look at um, the guy at the bottom of the list today, so that's the machine at position number 500, uh, we see that um, you know, back in, 19, uh, back in 20, uh, 20, 2003, um, the sum of all the computers was equal to the machine that's at the, at the bottom of the list today. So that's, a, that's sort of a striking uh, thing in itself. We have this, uh, of course, exponential effect taking place in the performance of our, of our machines, and uh, we see great changes taking place in really a short uh, period of time. Um, the other thing to note is that, um, you know, a guy at position number one on this list falls basically off the list in six to eight years. So things are changing quite rapidly. Um, an investment is made in a number one machine. That investment usually comes with a price tag of around $200 million for the number one computer. And after six years, that computer uh, basically isn't considered a supercomputer anymore. It needs to be replaced. So another investment is needed if you want to maintain sort of a level of computing power that uh, puts you at the top of this, uh, of this list. Um, you know, things happen at an incredible rate. So the laptop I'm using here to give this, uh, this presentation, it's a, uh, the laptop I use, I can run the benchmark on it. And when I run the benchmark on my laptop, I end up with 70 gigaflops, so 70 billion floating point operations per second out of my laptop. That's a stunning achievement. That's a, that's a device that I use mainly, to be honest, to read email. And I, get, I have the potential to get that kind of performance. And when I look, at, look back and where, where things were, my laptop is actually faster than the number one machine uh, that, uh, that started this list back in 1993. That number one machine 
was a machine that was used at Los Alamos National Laboratory. It was a thinking machine, uh, and it had a thousand processors in it. So today, you know, we have this incredible change that's uh, that's taking place, fueled by uh, by some of the events uh, in the uh, 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 the electronics industry. Of course, Moore's law being at the at the seat of that. And of course, you know, the phone I use, my iPhone. Um, uh, I can run the benchmark on it. There's an app for that. You can download the Linpack uh, app, benchmark app, and when you run, when I run it on my phone, I get four gigaflops. So that's a, again a stunning achievement from a phone, and that would have been considered one of the 500 fastest computers back in 1996. So incredible changes taking place over a very short period of time. The next slide looks at uh, that same data, but trying to extrapolate it and trying to understand where we're going in the near future. This is, of course, a dangerous thing to do. We're on a, we're on a logarithmic scale here, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, the thing to notice here is that we achieved a teraflop worth of computing. That's uh, 10 to the 12 floating point operations back in 1997. And that was done on a computer called the ASCII Red machine at Sandia National Laboratory. About 11 years later, we achieved a petaflop, 10 to the 15 floating point operations in our fastest computer, and that was on a computer uh, that was uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory and went by the name of Roadrunner. And, uh, you know, making the projection, we would see that perhaps we'll achieve an exaflop around 2020. Uh, so 10 to the 18 floating point operations, a billion, billion operations per second, um, uh, in the year 2020. And, um, you know, China's on record as saying that they will uh, achieve a, an exaflop in the year 2020. And in the U.S., we have plans to uh, develop uh, high-performance computing that will take us to exaflops in the year 2021. And I'll have more to say about that uh, in, the, in, the, in the next few slides. This is the top 10 computers on the list today. So the way to look at this is the guy at the top, the ranked number one, is at uh, the National Supercomputing Center in Wuxi, China. And that's a computer that goes by the name of the Sunway Tianhu Light. And that's a machine that uses a processor. That processor is the uh, Shenway processor. It's a Chinese processor. It's the SW26010 processor and it has 260 cores. So we have one chip, one socket, which has 260 computational cores in it, and they put together many of those uh, chips through a custom interconnect, which tie them together and allow information to flow between the processors. So that's a Chinese machine. It's totally Chinese in its character, and I'll, I'll describe that in a little more details as we, as we progress here. But that computer, that number one computer, has 10 million, over 10 million cores in it. So think of a machine which has 10 million processors in it. Think of uh, if you're going to use that machine at scale, you need to write a program that can effectively orchestrate the use of those 10 million cores to achieve high performance. And for the benchmark, they, they wrote a program, and that benchmark achieved 93 petaflops, that represents 74% of the theoretical peak performance of that computer. So the theoretical peak is a paper and pencil calculation that you do looking at the cycle time, the number of cores, the number of operations per core. Multiplying that together, we get the peak performance. And in this case, they achieved uh, 93 petaflops, which was 74% uh, uh, of that peak, which is 125 uh, petaflop uh, peak performance. This machine under load is uh, drawing uh, 15 megawatts of uh, power. So a megawatt, um, uh, in the U.S., if I uh, think about a megawatt and I use a megawatt um, uh, through the course of a year, I'll get a bill from the electric company for $1 million. So a megawatt year is a, is a million dollars. So in, in some sense, you can think of to turn this machine on for one year, Somebody's paying an electric bill of r roughly $15 million just for the power for the machine. And that's the, the power required for the processor, for the uh, uh, interconnect, and for the memory. It really doesn't include the cooling that's required. Cooling adds another maybe 20 to 30 percent uh, additional power requirement. The last column here represents uh, an efficiency number, and that's uh, gigaflops per watt. So we want that number to be as high as possible. We want as many floating point operations per, per watt 
uh, of, of power put into this machine. So this supercomputer in China gets a, gets a number of around six gigaflops per watt. And if we uh, just scan down the list here, we see we see other machines which are which are lower. There's only one machine which is actually a little bit uh, better than it, and that's a machine in Switzerland getting about seven and a half uh, gigaflops per watt. Um, so that's a very powerful machine in China. Ten million processors in it. 93%, or sorry, 93 petaflops, 74% of the theoretical peak, 15 megawatts of power, and six gigaflops uh, per watt. Um, if you take a look at the next five machines, you would need to add up those five machines to equal um, that one uh, computer that's in that's in China. That's sort of a you know just to just to show you how far ahead it places from the other machines itself. And scanning down the list, we see that uh, China has two machines on the list. Uh, U.S. has um, uh, five machines. Japan has a couple, and Swiss uh, have well, one machine on the list. The Tahu Light um, is five times the performance uh, of the number one machine in the U.S., the Titan computer here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which was uh, manufactured and uh, integrated by uh, Cray Computer. The, the U.S. Department of Energy has, um, uh, has really invested a lot in high-performance computer. It uses high-performance computer to drive the uh, computational efforts, the science that's being done at uh, many of the national laboratories. And to put it again in perspective, the Tahu Light is about equal to the performance of all of the Department of Energy computers that are represented on the top 500 list. So this is a very powerful uh, computer that's uh, that's on the list itself. In the U.S., um, we uh, there are plans within the Department of Energy to deploy a number of uh, high-performance systems above what we currently have. Uh, there's a there's an effort to deploy um, uh, this year and to have in development and in production in uh, next year uh, three machines. So um, there's an investment that's being made in hardware for these machines around a half a half a billion dollars in terms of the uh, hardware itself. And uh, two of those machines will be based on IBM and NVIDIA products. So we, again, we have uh, processors uh, being augmented with accelerators in this case to try to boost the performance. And those, those machines will go into Oak Ridge National Laboratory and, and Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And Argonne National Laboratory outside of Chicago will receive a machine that's based on Intel processors. Intel's next generation of, um, of many core processors. And the thought is that after these set of machines, um, the next uh, level would take us to exascale. That is, the exascale machines would, uh, would appear after this major investment in our, in our hardware infrastructure. Um, in, um, uh, in China, uh, China is, of course, interested in high-performance computing. Uh, they were building machines based on um, Intel and, and other technologies from the West. And the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, a couple years ago, decided to prevent China from receiving certain Intel technologies. And they cited concerns about uh, nuclear research being done on these systems. So in February of uh, 2015, uh, they, uh, they specifically pointed out the four locations uh, should not receive uh, Intel uh, parts, Intel equipment, uh, for use in their high-performance machines. And that was at the National Supercomputing Center in Guangzhou, where the, uh, one of the, the number two machine is located, the Tianhe 2. And also at the National Supercomputing Center in Tianjin, outside of uh, Beijing, they have a very fast computer. The National University for Defense Technology, they are the integrators of many of the high-performance systems in China. And the National Supercomputing Center in Chencha, where NUDT is located, those places are prohibited from receiving uh, Intel equipment. In, in some sense, the result of that uh, is to, uh, was to accelerate some of the development going on in China. So today in China, we see three separate developments underway to reach exascale. And I think you know what their what their motto is anything but from the U.S. in terms of the parts and the equipment that's going to be used. So in Wuxi, they're developing a follow-on to Tianhu Light that'll be based on uh, 
Chinese technology. It'll be a machine that uh, is very similar to the existing uh, Tianhu, which will be at uh, exascale. Uh, there's a machine being developed at the National University for Defense Technology in China. It's an upgrade to the Tianhe 2, and that'll be using uh, basically replacing Intel processors with uh, Chinese ARM processors uh, with an accelerator of their own design. And then the third uh, uh, way for exascale development is through a company called Sugun. Sugun is an integrator in China. They're going to be developing a machine with the assistance of the Chinese Academy of Science that will be based on an x86 architecture. It will be Chinese made and it will be in collaboration with uh, AMD. Uh, so that's sort of the Chinese effort going forward for high performance computing. In the U.S., uh, there's an effort going, uh, going on. It uh, was started last year. It's called the, National, uh, it's called the uh, Exascale uh, Computing Program. And that's a seven-year program that's been outlined by the uh, Department of Energy. And uh, the initial machine uh, at Exascale will be based on some advanced architecture. We don't exactly know what that architecture will be at this point, but it's uh, intended to be developed uh, and uh, in use uh, by 2021. And a second uh, machine will be uh, based on a, a capable Exascale uh, architecture, and that will be delivered in 2022 with uh, deployment in 2023. Um, th this Chinese processor is, is rather unusual in many ways. It's uh, the first homegrown many-core processor. Uh, it's uh, Shenwei, again, uh, is, the, uh, is the company. Uh, Sunwei is, 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 the, is the name of the company. And um, uh, it was developed by uh, China. It has a Chinese instruction set. It, has, uh, it uses 28 nanometer technology. It has one socket that has 260 cores. And in terms of the floating point peak performance, it's about three teraflops uh, that is, is represented in that, uh, in that, one, in that one chip. Um, uh, there's a rather detailed report that can be found at that URL at the top, uh, bitly uh, bit ly slash sunway minus uh, 2016, and that documents this machine and describes the machine in quite a bit of detail. But just a rough, design, just a rough uh, indication, this is, a, again, a Chinese design and fabricated and has their own instruction set, not following from any, uh, any standard instruction set. It has a cycle time of 1.45 gigahertz. That's a rather, uh, that's a rather modest uh, cycle time for, uh, for a high-performance computer. It has, an, again, a, a node or a socket, which is 260 cores, and that's divided into four core groups. Each of those core groups have 64 cores. They have sort of a master core plus a, um, a computational uh, processing element, which contains uh, 64 uh, uh, cores uh, arranged in an 8x8 uh, grid. And those can communicate with each other and can communicate from the, master, uh, from the main processor. Those lightweight cores have no, no cache associated with them. They have a user-managed scratch pad, a uh, very small 64 kilobyte uh, worth of scratch pad that can be used. So a rather modest architecture, a rather interesting design point for a supercomputer um, that represents um, uh, uh, three teraflops worth of, of performance. And a sort of an interesting aspect of this machine is that um, if we look at the performance uh, flop rate, so it's 22 floating point operations per second, and transfer rate, transferring information from memory, uh, is one byte per, uh, per, uh, per cycle. So, so the, the, um, uh, the, the ratio between flops per byte, the trade-off, is around 22. Ideally, we would like that number to be about one. So we get one flop per byte. In this case here, this machine is over-provisioned for floating point. They have an excess floating point capability and uh, has a very uh, a deficient in terms of delivering data uh, to the floating point units. Uh, just in, in, in putting that in perspective, some of the Intel products uh, are around seven uh, flops per byte. So a better, uh, still not at that number of one, but uh, a better balance between uh, data movement. Uh, so they take that um, they take that node, that one socket which has uh, 26, uh, 260 cores in it, and they put 1,000 of them in a cabinet. So we think of a cabinet uh, with um, with the 
potential of uh, three petaflops worth of computing power, and then they basically fill up a room, a room the size of roughly a basketball court with uh, 40 cabinets, uh, 40,000 uh, nodes in it, and 125 uh, petaflops of peak performance. Uh, that represents a, uh, 10 million cores. It has uh, 1.3 petabytes of primary memory. The memory that they use in this computer is DDR3 memory, so that's sort of the last generation memory. And uh, that's another um, reason the, the uh, uh, using slow memory plus a relatively modest cycle time gives them a, a relatively high perf uh, uh, effective uh, performance uh, based on the amount of energy consumed. So both a slow memory and a slow cycle time uh, g give rise to that uh, power number that we saw earlier. Again, for uh, the LIMPAC benchmark, they achieved 93 petaflops, or 74% of the theoretical peak, using about 15 megawatts of power. The machine is water-cooled, and that gives rise to this number of 6 uh, gigaflops uh, per watt of uh, power. Uh, in terms of the cost for this particular uh, machine, it's uh, estimated to cost around 280 million um, U.S. dollars or 1.8 billion uh, RMB Chinese uh, currency. Uh, moving forward here, uh, you know, this machine is rather unusual. Um, it achieved a high number in terms of the uh, benchmark, but the you know, question might be, how does it really do for some, uh, some applications, uh, for some real applications? Um, we have this uh, award, the Gordon Bell Award. It's, uh, it's, it was established in 1987. It's run by the uh, ACM, and it's awarded uh, at the big uh, supercomputer conference uh, that's held in November. And it recognizes out outstanding achievements in high-performance computing. The purpose is to track progress of parallel computing with an emphasis on rewarding innovation for high-performance computing uh, applications. And it was, uh, it was uh, 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 created by Gordon Bell, a, a pioneer in terms of high-performance computing and parallel computing and uh, computer architecture. He endowed this award, which uh, gives away $10,000 a year uh, to the application running on a high-performance machine, which demonstrates that, um, uh, that uh, uh, innovation in, in high-performance computing. So the way this works is um, at the supercomputing meeting, people submit papers, and if an author wants to enter for the Gordon Bell Prize, they mark their paper as being a potential Gordon Bell competitor. Uh, there's a committee which looks at papers, and uh, the committee sec selects six papers to be finalists for this competition, you know, the best six applications running on high-performance machines, basically. And those six papers get to make a presentation uh, at the supercomputing meeting, and then a winner is chosen uh, based on the results of their, uh, of their uh, documented uh, performance uh, through their paper. This year, in November, or last year at the supercomputing uh, uh, conference that was held in November in Utah, there were six finalists. Uh, one finalist was from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, another from um, Imperial College in England one from uh, the Japanese High Performance Computing Center, and then uh, there were three entries that were made by the Chinese. Uh, those entries were all run on the um, uh, Tianhu Light uh, computer, and the winner of uh, the Gordon Bell competition uh, for, for, S, uh, for, for last year, for, for uh, 2016, uh, went to um, uh, an application that was run on 10 million cores, the full machine at scale, doing an uh, uh, atmospheric dynamics calculation, doing some climate model studies uh, through that. Uh, so this machine not only achieves uh, a fast results for a benchmark, but it also achieves the most impressive results for an application uh, run on a, a supercomputer, not just a uh, benchmark uh, example. So uh, this machine, I think, goes beyond what one might consider to be a stunt machine put together just to achieve that benchmark result. If we take again a look at this top 500 list, uh, these are the vendors that make, uh, that construct, put together, integrate uh, the 500 computers that are used, uh, uh, that, that are out and in use. So we see that uh, HP Enterprises uh, is, is the leader uh, in some sense with uh, 112 uh, systems. 
uh, uh, Lenovo has a large number of machines and, and so on and so forth down, down the list uh, with various vendors uh, of high-performance systems. The striking thing here is that um, China uh, has a number of vendors now. They have a, a, a number of vendors, and they're able to secure 36% uh, of that, uh, of that uh, top 500 list in terms of uh, uh, vendors that are churning out uh, computers. If we take a look at the country share of the top 500 list, so this is looking at the 500 computers, and we're going to look at uh, where those computers are deployed, not where they're made, but where they're actually deployed. Uh, we have this tree graph. Uh, here we have um, a graph which has uh, 500 rectangles. Each rectangle represents a high-performance machine on the top 500 list. The area of that rectangle, in some sense, reflects the performance. So the number one computer is that, uh, is that uh, yellow computer, uh, yellow rectangle at the top, which has the largest area. That's the Tianhu Light. Uh, the number two machine is, is right below it, again, a Chinese machine. And the number three machine is, is one from the U.S. If you add up uh, the numbers by country, so in the U.S. we have 171 of the top 500 computers. China also has 171 of the top 500 computers. So that's an interesting uh, statistic. Uh, China has a third of the systems, and um, uh, this is really represents uh, the lowest point that the U.S. has fallen in terms of the number of top 500 uh, machines uh, uh, on, on the list. They, they usually have had more than, uh, the U.S. has had more than half of, them, half of the machines on the list. So China's made a very strong uh, investment in high performance computing uh, back in the year 2001, they had zero computers on the list, and that steadily has grown uh, to today where they, uh, they are in a, in a tie with the U.S. in terms of the number of machines. I'd like to just uh, turn and, and, and look at uh, this uh, benchmarking thing for a minute. I have to confess that I'm an accidental benchmarker. Um, uh, back in 1977, I was involved in a project called uh, the LINPAC project. LINPAC is a package of mathematical software for solving systems of uh, linear equations. And uh, in the course of developing that software, we tested and, and experimented with um, uh, various machines. Uh, this is the group that, um, uh, that was involved in LINPAC. Uh, the person on the far right there is uh, Jim Bunch from uh, University of California, San Diego. Next to him is Pete Stewart, again, a, a, a numerical analyst from the University of Maryland. Uh, next to him is Cleve Moeller, uh, uh, one of the guys who founded the MathWorks and the inventor of MATLAB. And next to him is a 1977 version of me. So that's a version of me with a little bit uh, more hair than I have today. Uh, that's my car uh, with a LINPAC license number uh, on it. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the course of developing that, um, that package of software, uh, I put together a little table that represented uh, how fast various computers I had access to solved that system of linear equations using uh, the software from LINPAC, and it's collected in this, uh, this list that appears in the appendix, Appendix B, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, user's guide. And that really represents the start of the LINPAC benchmark and represents the beginning that ultimately led to the uh, top 500 list. Well, there are, there are many benchmarks today, and here's just a short list of some of the ones that relate to uh, scientific uh, computing. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they, they measure or probe certain aspects of, uh, of high-performance computing in a certain, uh, certain domains. Uh, LINPAC is uh, recognized as a metric for ranking machines. It gained prominence in the early 90s. Uh, back at that time, there was a strong correlation between uh, the ranking and uh, what would really be seen for various applications on high-performance computers. So perhaps back in the uh, early 90s, it was a, it was a reasonable way to uh, measure uh, high-performance computing. It translated into what people saw for applications. But a lot has changed over time. And... Um, uh, this benchmark, uh, the HPL, the LIMPAC benchmark, no longer strongly correlates with real applications. And uh, the applications have changed. The hardware has uh, changed in many ways. And uh, we need a better way of looking at high-performance systems. If, you, if one designs a computer 
uh, to do good for LINPAC, to do good on this HPL thing, it may lead to a very imbalanced computer for many applications. So we struggled to look at um, uh, different ways of, of utilizing that. Perhaps we can see some of the change that's taken place in hardware by looking at what Intel has done to their processors. In the early days of the Xeon processor from Intel, those processors, each core uh, uh, was able to complete two floating point operations per cycle in what I call double precision or 64-bit floating point operations. If one does 32-bit operations, the performance rate doubles, so we get four flops per cycle in the early days. In 2009, Intel processors doubled that to get four floating point operations per cycle. In 2011, eight floating point operations per cycle. In 2013, we were getting 16 floating point operations per cycle out of Haswell and Broadwell. And today, with Intel's processors, each core can uh, effectively compute 32 floating point operations per cycle uh, uh, with, uh, with its processors. And we think about uh, the many core processor from Intel, which has over 60 cores in it, 60 cores times 32 floating point operations per cycle is a very impressive execution rate. And one of the issues today is that um, the um, uh, accessing data presents a real challenge or a bottleneck for looking at, uh, for looking at these, these uh, applications. And uh, here, uh, what I'm showing is the effects of uh, looking at uh, moving data from main memory into the part of the machine where the computation can actually be done. On some systems, that takes 167 cycles to do that uh, operation, just to move the data to where you can do the floating point operations. And um, you know, in the time it takes to move though, that one piece of data, you could have done 2,672 floating point operations on these machines. So data movement is really critical. And um, today we have machines which have uh, tremendous floating point uh, capability, um, uh, but uh, data movement is very expensive relative to the, uh, to the over-provisioned floating point that we have in our machines. And that needs to be taken into, uh, into account. Many of the problems that are solved on our large machines relate to um, uh, simulations, and those simulations are, are um, conducted uh, through the understanding of what happens in solving uh, partial differential equations. In this particular case, we're looking at a, um, a diffusion uh, a fluid flow problem. We have a partial differential equation. It gets discretized, and that discretization leads to a linear system of equations very similar to what we did for the LINPAC benchmark, but in this case, the matrix is large and sparse. So the matrix A that we have turns out to be very sparse, having very few non-zero elements per row, and we need effective ways of dealing with that problem, since it really represents what, what's being performed on these machines. And we turn to a benchmark, uh, we turn to looking for benchmarks which more reflect this kind of application. So the benchmark that we're looking at today uh, to deploy is something called the HPCG benchmark. It does a conjugate gradient algorithm to solve a large sparse matrix problem, the kinds of problems that we see uh, solved commonly on some of the high performance computers. So it's a synthetic problem that we put together for this benchmark. There's ways to ensure that uh, we uh, actually get, uh, the, that, that when running the problem, we actually get the correct results. And that, re that when, when we run that benchmark on the machines, we get a different story in terms of the performance and the characteristic of various computers. So this is a ranking uh, of the top 10 computers using this uh, HPCG benchmark uh, from the November list. And the computer in the number one position has changed. Uh, a number of machines have shifted position. Uh, the number one computer is the computer in, in Japan. It's the K computer. That machine has about uh, 700,000 cores. Uh, the LINPAC number it achieved was about uh, 10 petaflops, and what's achieved for running this sparse benchmark problem is just 0.6 petaflops, or about 5% of the theoretical peak. And that number turns out to be pretty impressive for the computers that are on this list. So you can see that the number one machine for the LINPAC benchmark, which was uh, running at 93 petaflops, is now running at uh, 0.37 petaflops, or about 0.3%, 0.3% of the theoretical peak. 
uh, for that machine. So it, it really presents a different uh, light in terms of how these machines can perform when doing real scientific uh, problems. Um, and it, th these two benchmarks represent uh, bookends, perhaps, on how we can uh, better look at our, our computers. Um, what I'm showing here is, uh, is the peak performance in blue, and uh, the, the red represents the LINPAC benchmark for solving that dense matrix problem. And when we take a look at uh, uh, solving, uh, uh, looking at running the benchmark that does this iterative method for solving a uh, large sparse system, we get a performance level which is far uh, lower than what we see from the LINPAC benchmark or the peak performance. So that really represents bookends in some sense for the, um, uh, for the performance that we see out of these uh, high performance uh, computers. And I guess the story here is that um, the classical analysis of algorithms may not be valid. Processors today are over provisioned for floating point. Uh, data movement is extremely expensive. Uh, the operation count is not really a good indicator at the time it takes to solve, uh, to solve a problem. So algorithms that do more operations may actually uh, take less time in terms of solving, uh, solving uh, problems. Um, I'm going to conclude here and take a look at some of the things which I think are critical in terms of uh, high-performance computing and algorithms and, and software design. And I would say that these are, uh, these are major issues that we face and major challenges uh, that, we, that we have in terms of overcoming uh, certain things to effectively use our high-performance computers. So one of the things that is critical today is uh, parallel, com parallel computing and effectively exploiting large numbers of uh, processes. Uh, with the uh, number one computer, we have, we have a situation where we have um, you know, this incredible number of, uh, of, of processors associated with our computation that we need to effectively uh, use. And we need mechanisms so that we can avoid synchronization. So synchronization uh, in a parallel computations cause all the processors to come to uh, halt waiting for the very last one to complete its execution before you carry on to the next, the next state. So we need to break that fork join model of computation, that bulk synchronous processing that goes on. We need to reduce communication. Communication really is a bottleneck in terms of doing our operations. We would like to focus on algorithms that can somehow represent the lower bound in terms of communication. So there's a number of ways to do that. My colleague at uh, Berkeley, uh, Jim Demmel, has uh, come up with uh, uh, ways of expressing things to, uh, to say that algorithms, uh, if expressed this way, have the, can achieve a lower bound in terms of the communication pattern uh, for them. And we need to strive for that, that sort of uh, reduction. We need to think about mixed precision, mixing single and double, and maybe even going lower to half precision, 16-bit floating point operations. We get this increase in terms of uh, speed of computation, doubling if we go from 64 to 32-bit operations, and also an enhancement in terms of the speed of data movement. Some problems uh, like um, uh, neural network problems, uh, deep learning, can actually get by with uh, much shorter precision, 16-bit precision, and today we're seeing, uh, we're seeing computing parts uh, come out with that kind of, uh, uh, with that kind of accuracy. We need to think about auto-tuning in the context of putting the smarts into the software so it can effectively adapt to the underlying conditions of a dynamically changing hardware environment. That is, build into the software the ability to, to uh, adapt to what's going on in the environment as it's running, changing some of the characteristics to uh, optimize its use. Uh, in order to do that. We can't rely on, or I can't rely on a user turning the right knobs and getting things correct from the start. We need to build that into the software and adapt to it. We need to think about fault uh, resistance in our algorithms. Uh, today, if a, if a um, computation, uh, if we have a process fail, the computation will fall over. The model that we have in terms of using MPI as a structure doesn't have any mechanism to recover from failure today. And we need to think about how we can build into the algorithm the ability to transition past uh, failure and get things uh, continue to run uh, in the presence of those failures. And those failures may be hard process failures where we lose something, or they may be a results of a bit flip occurring during the computation and uh, accommodating that. 
And finally, let me say, you know, one, one of the things that we, uh, that we uh, perhaps need to think about is reproducibility of results. And today, um, with our computers running in parallel, we really can't uh, say that we have reproducible results. I can't guarantee the order at which certain computations are going to be done on my machine. And because I can't guarantee the order, today and tomorrow running the same problem on the same machine may result in different results being generated. Different round-off errors are going to occur because of the ordering, and that may translate into uh, 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 different results being generated by the, uh, by the results. And sometimes that's an important thing, sometimes it's not. Uh, you know, the algorithms that we develop, we'd like to have error bounds associated with them so we know when the results are going to be considered, quote, correct. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the future, um, you know, we may need to uh, ensure this reproducibility of, uh, because of uh, the application demanding it or because when we're debugging programs, we'd like to be assured that the program's doing something the same way on, on successive runs. So with that, I'll conclude, and um, uh, let me say that uh, the work I've talked about uh, comes about uh, through the support uh, uh, through many organizations and collaboration with many of my colleagues at the University of Tennessee and at other uh, laboratories around, uh, around the country and around the world. So with that, I will uh, stop, and perhaps we can um, uh, ask for some questions in the remaining uh, minutes here. John. Yeah. Hey, Jack. Thanks yeah. for that. We do have um, a whole bunch of questions, and I'll try and pick out a few um, uh, that represent several questions together. So we've had um, several attendees ask uh, about both the failure rate um, of these very large-scale systems and what impact um, that has on their practical usefulness versus clusters of smaller machines that you might find in um, university departments or smaller institutions. Right. So failures um, uh, do occur, and uh, they can be very disruptive. So if, I, if I'm running one application on the whole machine and I have a failure occur, a process failure fails or a network uh, goes bad, uh, that application will be terminated, and I will lose the information that was generated uh, during the course of that run unless I've done something to prevent it. And what I could do is to do a checkpoint, that is checkpoint the state of the computation so that if I encounter such a failure that I can restart the computation from that point. So think of a computation that may take 20 hours on a, on a computer at scale or using the whole machine. Uh, I should be doing a checkpoint every so often so that I can recover from, let's say, two hours worth of computation and uh, carry on in the presence of that uh, failure. If I'm running on a computer and not using the whole machine but just using part of the machine and my process fails for some reason, then my application will go away, but the other applications running on the machine may not go away. So they may continue in the presence of a failure that's occurred in another part of the machine which doesn't affect them. So in some sense, that's not a, that's not a tremendous loss. I, I lose information if I was the application that was running, but the other applications can, can successively uh, carry on uh, in, in that way. So th does this occur on high-performance machines? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, it occurs very frequently, I'll say, when a new computer is installed. So computers that are just being burnt in, let's say, uh, encounter many, many failures uh, associated with them. Uh, there's, uh, and uh, uh, over the course of its life, we see that, uh, we see that rate go down uh, until we get very few failures that occur. And then towards the end of its life, as the hardware ages, we see more failures starting to occur again. So, uh, you know, there's that, quote, bathtub um, uh, uh, view of, of the failures where we get a lot at the beginning and a lot at the end of its life. Uh, during the middle, we get very few. What's the failure rate? Um, you know, we can, we can quote the numbers maybe on the order of one or two a day uh, that occur on some of the computers that we have today. Um, we also have a lot of questions about um, architecture, um, specialized architecture, um, limitations that we might be seeing on performance caused by general adoption of the um, x86 uh, architecture. Um, do you want to comment on that and, and whether we might be seeing another fork in the future between commodity and high-end processing? 
Right. So, um, you know, in the old days, high performance computing supercomputers were special purpose processors. And we can think about companies like Cray and CDC and, and others that produced those machines. Those were not commodity processors. They were designed specifically for high-end computing. They're very expensive to develop. And as microprocessors enhanced in their performance um, over time, it became to the point where those big machines were not competitive with the microprocessors that we had. So building a machine was not uh, cost effective, and in the end, those machines were uh, basically abandoned, and those companies had to switch their model and adapt the commodity, uh, commodity architectures. Today, we're seeing um, a slight change with um, augmenting those commodity architectures with special purpose <clears throat> accelerators and uh, boosting the performance of those computers through the use of those, uh, those accelerated uh, technologies. And I think that, that presents a, a very viable and uh, persistent uh, way to go forward. Uh, you know, in China, we have uh, this uh, rather unique um, design point for a, for a processor um, uh, developing a machine around this 260 core, uh, uh, having very certain characteristics associated with it to, to achieve high performance computing. I would say that that computer is very difficult to program, however. So one can program it. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to do that. So the, uh, the, the way to uh, you know, develop uh, uh, applications for this is to invest in people to do the optimization to effectively design something, craft something around, around that, uh, that architecture. And uh, when the architecture changes, those applications uh, will have to be redone to adapt to a new architecture. So one of the advantages with commodity processors, we can usually get by with uh, moving forward with the application with, now, with not too large an effort and retooling uh, for that uh, new architecture as it emerges. Uh, but um, uh, overall, uh, we see that uh, in order to effectively use, uh, to effectively uh, develop things for high-performance computing, it is uh, going to deviate from uh, from the uh, commodity processors and using specialized processors. And today, Intel has uh, many core processors uh, through through its uh, Knight's Landing products. Uh, we see that uh, same idea being uh, being designed and used in some of the other products. Uh, uh, the ARM architecture is another one that uh, that comes to mind as being something which is going to exploit that space as well. So it'll be interesting to see how things evolve. I think we'll always have commodity processors, commodity plus accelerators, and then perhaps uh, the special purpose processors for doing uh, certain problems uh, uh, very well. So you touched on this in your answer, but we've had several questions, and I just wanted to get a quick read from you. Um, do you think that HPC necessarily implies low-level programming, or is there an opportunity um, for high-level languages to make a practical impact? Right. So um, uh, programming is sort of the, you know, a critical aspect of uh, the effective use of high-performance machines. Uh, you know, we have a lot of legacy codes, which are Fortran C-based, uh, that, um, uh, that a tremendous investment's been made in those codes over time, and it's hard just to abandon that and to, and to construct something out of a uh, newly formed uh, language. But those kinds of things are going to be critical as we go forward, as we have machines which have uh, you know, these, these billions of threads of execution is anticipated for some of the exascale machines, and effectively using that level of parallelism really is going to require some new ways of looking at and implementing and programming these, these machines. So instead of abandoning all the software, I would envision a situation where we remove critical parts of applications and re-instrument them, rewrite them in different programming paradigms, different programming languages that can effectively embrace that level of parallelism and can effectively be used for those critical regions of, of an application. Not throwing away the, the majority of code, but rewriting sections of it in the specially, let's call it special languages that can effectively accommodate uh, that level of, uh, of parallelism. But it's a critical issue and uh, research and uh, new ideas are needed in the area of, uh, of languages, as is true of that whole ecosystem that goes around high performance computers. 
So not only the languages, but the compilers, the operating systems, the uh, algorithms, the numerical libraries, all those things need to be enhanced to effectively use the technologies that we have. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for, for all of those answers in the presentation. Uh, on behalf of SIGHBC and um, the ACM, I want to thank Jack Tangara again for his informative presentation and great answers to your questions. And I also want to thank each of you for making the time to attend and participate today. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be available online in just a few days at webinar.acm.org. Um, you can also find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at acm.org. Uh, also, as a reminder, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, uh, which you should see on your screen in just a moment. So on behalf of ACM and SIGHPC, Jack Dungara, and myself, John West, Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again in the future.